Have you ever witnessed someone say if you don't like it, leave and everyone left? What was the story? A former industrial job I used to have said that during an all hands meeting. We were understaffed, underpaid, and overworked, and everyone knew it. Instead of the 2 stroke 1 ratio of 2 machines to 1 operator for safety reasons, we'd have 4, 6, 8, because people were getting paid less than most retail jobs to bust their asses in some of the most disgusting work I've ever done. You'd come home covered in moldy coolant, metal shavings, and stink. Machines started breaking down, because they'd never shut them down to perform maintenance on them, so we'd often have massive problems, which, of course, meant even more overtime to make up for the broken machines, and people started quitting. Management's response was to tell us that they expected us to work harder, because they couldn't get more help in. One of my co-workers, who generally gave no fricks, asked, in front of everyone in that room, why they didn't try raising the poor wages, and see if they could entice people that way. The response was we're not having that conversation right now. If you don't like it, you can quit. Who? Buddy. Was that the wrong thing to say? As soon as word got out to the other shifts, what can only be called a freaking exodus began. We lost half of each shift within the week. I stuck around for a few more weeks, until I had a conflict with my schooling at the time. Since one of my classes got out about 30 minutes before my shift, 30 minutes away. So I warned them in advance that I might be a few minutes late one day a week, maybe, and got told that I needed to decide what was more important, my school, or my job. So I quit, and giggled my butt off at the sign in the HR office that said we had an almost 80% turnover rate. I never did find out what happened to that hellhole, but I can't imagine anything good with losing that many people. The poor HR rep seemed like she was just so freaking done with everything, and seemed so very apologetic as she took my badge. I never understood that what's more important, school or the job thing. Seriously if job was super important to you, you wouldn't be studying. Of course everyone will choose school over their job. Every year the military has this event they host named the Warrior Games. It's like the Olympics for men and women who were injured while serving. I'm a decent cyclist so I was selected to represent the Marine Corps team in that event. I'm not sure where they hold the event these days but the year I was selected they flew us out to Colorado Springs. When I got there I quickly realized that 99% of the marines competing was still active duty. I had retired a few years prior so it was weird being around marines again. Almost immediately after arriving the senior leaders and officers in charge began demanding that I get my hair cut and to shave my beard. At first I laughed it off and thought they were joking. Turns out they were quite serious. The lady who was in charge of the marine team was a major and she took me off to the side and ordered me to get a haircut. I reminded her that I had retired a few years prior and was no longer required to abide by active military grooming standards. Then a light bulb went off in her head and with a smirk she said well you either get a haircut or you can go home. Your choice. So I smirked back and said guess I'm flying home they had already prepurchased our airplane tickets home so all I did was call Delta, explain what happened, and the lady on the other end transferred my ticket to a flight home the next day. I had taken a few weeks off work to attend this event so I just went back home and enjoyed my time off with my hair and beard. When I was a kid I stayed at a friend's house for the weekend. My friend's mother was one of those parents who, at the dinner table, required their kids to eat everything on their plate come heck or high water. I had been served way too much food, and said that I can't eat at all. The mother said to me, you can either finish your food or leave the table. I promptly left the table. This totally blew the minds of my friend and his siblings. It had never occurred to them that leaving the table was actually a viable option. When my mother picked me up the next day, my friend's mother told her what had happened and said I was the rudest little boy. I think my mother was actually quite proud of me. My boss said don't like it, try finding a job like this one with better pay and benefits so I google it and now I just had my 14th year anniversary at the new job. My great grandmother is notorious for being a mean old bee. It was Thanksgiving at her house, and much of the extended family were there. She started harping on my mom's cousin for something, like she always does, and my mom's cousin was like, Grandma, can't we just have a nice dinner for once and great grandma was like, if you don't like it, leave and every last cousin, aunt, uncle, 
and all of their food disappeared to my aunt's house. LOL. I want to know what happened after this LOL. I had an insufferable supervisor once and we'd have these 15 minute, pre-shift meetings. Dude would just stand in there and lord over everybody for the duration and talk about how bad we were doing. The phrase we suck was one of his favorites. Finally one day, he's really on one and summons the testicular fortitude to say if you don't like it, there's the door. His second in command got upset at this and walked out. He stood there, stunned for about 5 seconds and then ran out the door after him. He later ended up having some mental instability and quitting. The second in command is now the supervisor. I survived all of these meetings by default assuming he wasn't talking to me. Comma summons the testicular fortitude. I am stealing this line for future use. It must have been easy for him to have that much testicular fortitude considering he sounds like a massive testicle himself. My husband worked at a really toxic job for a while. As staff got fired or quit, they weren't replaced, to cut costs, and instead the remaining two employees were worked to death. Finally, the owner, who was a crappy boss and terrible businessman, called a meeting with the two to try to force an attitude adjustment. The employees tried to be constructive and talk about things they saw that needed to be improved upon to make things work better, and of course this egotistical butthole owner wouldn't have it. He told them if they couldn't handle the expectations that they were free to levs, so they did. Both of them left immediately and never set foot in the store again. I don't think the owner was expecting that at all. He expected them to grovel and beg to keep their jobs and thank him for the opportunity to work 70 hour weeks under his tyrannical rule. My husband called me after that meeting and was so upset he couldn't hardly tell me what happened. He was terrified he was so sure I would be angry at him for quitting his job when we really weren't in a position that I could support us. I wasn't mad at all. I was so proud of him for not taking the crap that was being doled out to him and doing what is best for his mental health. He's a dang good man and deserve better. You're a good wife. He's a lucky guy to have that kind of support. Worked at Thai restaurant. Owner's daughter who was manager left town for a couple weeks and we realized once she left that she was stealing our tips tipping us out way less than herself for over a year if working there with her. When she got back we confronted her at the end of the night during her shift since she refused to meet with us in an official group meeting. The four of us, servers, called her out and she said if you don't like it then get out or sue me. We were all 18 20 years old and didn't really know what to do so three of us quit on the spot in that moment and walked out the door. I'll never forget the look on her face. Sad to hear that. Thai people are usually nice and very hospitable. Not exactly but my sister had a habit of picking fights with people and when it wasn't going her way, she'd tell them she was removing them from her life. She's done it to boyfriends, longtime friends, sorority sisters, she did it to me twice. The first time, I rolled my eyes because she's younger than me. After the second time my sister told me I'm removing you from my life, you're toxic and unfriended me and told family I was toxic. In reality, I wasn't letting her be toxic selfish, and under the influence of whatever she was on with to me, my spouse, or my kids, so she decided it was a good idea to threaten us. I said okay, fine, but her usual routine, after a few weeks she came around and wanted to pretend she never said the things she said I didn't respond. She claimed it all was a joke and she had a right to be in my kids lives. I haven't spoken to her in two years. I honestly do not miss her drama and it was the best decision for my family. It highlighted how bad the generational dysfunction was in my family and how it was expected to just overlook bad behavior and people please for everyone else's comfort. I realized that I didn't want my kids to repeat that cycle. I vowed to always put my kids first. I'm not popular in my family right now but I've never been happier and this was the first year I got to enjoy holidays without having panic attacks or dread. When someone walks out of your life, let them. I thought you were talking about a child aged sister until you mentioned your kids. Back in the mid 90s, a co-worker was under a great deal of stress. He was performing a low skill role in a high skill industry during a tremendous crunch that was very important to the company. Entry level stuff. More a job that's a stepping stone than a career. Despite that, he was an integral member of the team with institutional knowledge background that couldn't be replaced overnight. Actually, it couldn't be replaced at all. During a team meeting to go over status, progress, etc., 
He asked our boss for some help as he was overwhelmed and simply couldn't keep up anymore. Boss said, if you can't handle it, there's the door. Dude just stood up and, without a single word, he walked right out. Boss ended up having to do his job until completion of the initiative. Probably bitched and complained about how hard it is to find good help these days after. My lecture wanted us to have an extra class, online, after the exams because we had missed a lesson during the semester. We asked him if he could at least move it to the afternoon but he insisted it be at 9am. So everyone logged into classroom but only two people were answering his questions. He then decided to take the register and everyone was present. Then he said, I'm not forcing anyone to be here, if you don't want to participate in the lesson, go everyone logged out immediately except me because I had gone to the bathroom, when I came back, I found him calling for my name, he later logged out and sent me the PPT of the lesson. I feel sorry for him. When I worked third shift at Walmart the management tried to change a shirt policy overnight, they all of a sudden decided that we had to wear blue collared shirts and not blue t-shirts anymore. One of the managers named Jackie, who was a total B, came up to my two friends, and myself, and told us we had to either go buy new shirts right then or go home. We left. Frozen Dairy didn't get done that night, and we got to go home and play Destiny all night. Next day they never said another word about our shirts. Frick Walmart by the way. Unless you're a WoW Raider this probably doesn't apply, but I've been in a number of raid formations, especially back in the day, where the raid leader announces some wonky loot rules that disproportionately benefit himself close friends, and would then say if you don't like it, leave. Yep, yeah, we left. My mother is well known for her Christmas Easter whatever tantrums. She threw a particularly good one when I was about 14, and yelled the infamous line. My uncle and aunt piled themselves, their daughter, and myself and about 5 of my siblings into their 4WD, and we all left to go to their place, picking up KFC for lunch on the way. Don't know what kind of Christmas my mother had, but ours was pretty good in the end. So glad we didn't get pulled over. We had a similar situation with my aunt back in the day, only said aunt was already being investigated by child services, and when my parents took my cousins home with us. It was about 4 hours away, and she didn't try to get them back immediately. DSS came a week later, found out we had the children and asked my parents if they'd adopt my cousins. They said yes, and now I have two sister cousins. I used to be the co-owner and station manager for a small online radio station. We were all digital, so I rarely met any of our staff in person, and we were online 24 stroke 7. So if I was awake I was pretty much always working. We had a dedicated team of assistant station managers, about 6 of them, in charge of various things, and we would have once weekly meetings with me, the Asms, and the other co-owner. None of us were paid. This was strictly a volunteer gig. It cost the co-owner and I money to keep the station on the air, but it was a labor of love. At one point I began to get close to one of the asms and we started dating. The co-owner of the station got jealous, and began to give him crap about his work, demanding that he read her graphics and coding over and over and over even when it was perfectly fine. He laid into the asm at one of our weekly staff meetings and I lost it. I told him that he needed to stop his behavior or I was going to walk. Fine, he said. This is my station. If you don't like the way I run it, leave. I quit on the spot. So did half of the assistant station managers. Then a large number of the DJs. Within two years, the whole thing had to shut down because no one could work with my former co-owner. Because he was a petty tyrant who had to have things his way and couldn't let people live their lives. I've never felt such petty glee as when I saw their off the air blog post. New management was hired and took over scheduling, from me, who was covering for a now gone manager, without understanding any of the intricacies of scheduling. After two weeks we had an all staff meeting to address grievances based on her incredibly poor method of scheduling, and she refused to back down, dropping the famous ultimatum. Out of a staff of 40 or so employees, I think maybe half a dozen stayed. I find it amusing there's a quarter dozen people complaining that you didn't say 6. If they don't like your choice of words, maybe they should just leave. 
I was a whistleblower at my workplace. I witnessed my manager mentally and physically abuse a 101 year old woman. I worked in a care home. I raised the alarm. And staff above the manager didn't deal with things quick enough and over worry of a bad name. Press had gotten a hold of the story. They were trying to keep it quiet and were going to allow this manager back to work on a final warning. We were a small team. About 8 of us. When they told us that, all of us reached into our bags and threw our notices at them. It was all of us. Or her. A week or so later and them paying her £15 k she was gone. Worst thing is, we were a charity care home. She basically got thousands and thousands of pounds for abusing a vulnerable elderly woman. I know she got away with it, but what you guys did was 100% the right thing, and very admirable. Well I wasn't here for this one unfortunately, but my high school English class had this scenario. The senior AP English teacher was notorious in my graduating class for not really giving a dang about a lot of the students. From the way I was told, they were going over quizzes to which the teacher started going over some vague subjective response and how it was wrong. The students started arguing and the conversation came full circle to where the teacher started agreeing with the students. Once he realized this he started backing off that answer and correcting students again, causing more frustration. This resulted in a student saying, there's no point in learning this if we're wrong even if we were right at one point. Well if there's any of you who don't find this valuable, you can stand up and leave the classroom. Two students of 28 remained. I was absent cause I was sick, but what a sight it would have been. It's always when you're not there that something exciting happens. Had a teacher nobody liked pull the old if you don't want to behave, you can leave my classroom on a classmate. The whole class got up and left. Things hadn't been going well in this class since he had started teaching us. The main problem was that he was a really bad teacher, like, he seemed to have no knowledge on his own subject history, or at least was incredibly bad at transferring his knowledge. We didn't have any respect for him, and he tried to keep us in line by being extremely strict, but in an unfair way. Wouldn't let anyone ask questions anymore, because he could never answer them. Screamed at students if they quietly asked their neighbor for a pencil, that sort of stuff. I don't remember what my classmates did that angered the teacher, but it was something minor. We were all fed up with him. So when he told my classmate to just leave, we all did. Felt really rebellious and like I was part of a bigger plan or something. It was great. We got into trouble for it, but also got the teacher fired so it was worth it. Had my first job as a massage therapist. My friend from school also got a job there. The business was taken over by this lady who decided to also hire her friend, who hadn't even graduated massage therapy school. The owner's friend would start sessions way earlier than necessary if the clients got there early, which meant that sometimes my friend and I would sometimes have to scramble to get ready for couples massages with her. For example, my friend was still commuting and was a few minutes away, and the owner's friend tried to start having the clients get ready. It was frustrating because we'd have no time to talk to the clients before the sessions like we were supposed to. One day I politely told her that my friend wasn't there yet, and she should wait to put the clients on the table until he was actually there so he could talk to his client. She got super mad and told the new owner I was being rude to her. Well the new owner clearly got a different story, and started texting me telling me I was in trouble. I didn't ever find out what the actual issue was directly from her, but I knew it was because of her friend because of how quickly it happened after I told her friend to wait to start that session. I tried to set up a meeting in person to talk about it, but she kept refusing and said we could talk about it over text. I decided I wasn't going to deal with that unprofessional behavior from a manager and walked in to tell her I quit. Turns out my friend also quit that day because of her friend's nonsense. The business owner was left with her unlicensed uncertified friend, and a stand in that was extremely unreliable, on a really full schedule. When I was in high school I was part of a FRC robotics team. The coach decided that no one who missed a practice during the last week of the season would be allowed to attend the tournaments. Of course the band class had a mandatory concert during one of the meetings. So when I brought up that I wouldn't skip the graded band concert the coach gave the ultimatum. About a third of the team got up and left, including all the captains. Coach backed out of that really fast. At an off-campus college party, the host, a tenor voice major in the music department, 
started playing Wagner and Verdi operas full blast, when those attending asked him to play something else that they could all like. He said, you all need to learn to like opera, if you won't give it a fair try, you can always just leave. And with that, everyone left. I like opera, but if everyone else is asking for a change at a party then you better believe I would change it. Grade 8 language arts class. To preface this, I was never an aggressive student, generally the teacher's pet, the person who if a teacher was away for the day would be tasked in their notes to the sub to be able to assist and give them directions. The time, 20 some odd years ago shortly after the Columbine shooting, this context is critical to the he story, to location, middle of nowhere Alberta, a small country school. So our regular teacher was out for the day and had left a note directing the sub to ask me if she had questions about what had been covered. Sub comes in reads note and opens the teacher's weekly planner. Then begins writing our words for the weekly spelling test on the board. Except, she opened the wrong week. Instead of the current week, she had opened the prior week. At this point being the goody two shoes that I was, and much to my classmates dismay, although our teacher would have corrected us when she was back so it wouldn't have helped them, I raised my hand and politely informed her that I believed she had gotten the page wrong as we had previously covered this material. What happened next? I couldn't make up. She lost her crap. She started ranting about how teens in general and me specifically were a danger to her. How she didn't know who were her friends and her enemies in the class. We'd never had this sub before. How she had every right to fear for her life. She then capped it off by saying she was the teacher and if we wanted to think in her classroom, well there was the door. We were welcome to leave. I was never a popular child so I wasn't really expecting one of the popular kids, and my sometime bully, to stand up collectively with everyone else, pull me to my feet and we all walked out. Now I mentioned above that we attended a small country school. There was no place to go. So we just sat in the hallway until the principal came down to chew us out for not being in class. The sub was gone by the start of the next period and the principal taught the rest of our teacher's classes that day. The freaking bully was like, no one talks like that to my victim I'm kidding but that's really cool of them. I work for a hoisting transport contracting company at a large refinery and for the most part it's very relaxed. Basically it's more cost effective to have more than enough people just in case something goes wrong so a lot of the time we just sit around waiting for something to do. My foreman for some reason doesn't like this and thinks we all have it too easy even though he is totally redundant and literally not needed at all here. And was telling one of the guys one day that maybe he needs to go to the yard. Our HQ main office we are dispatched from and all our equipment is stored. And see what a real job is like. So he did. He called the office and transferred there permanently and our foreman on site lost his freaking mind. He didn't even say anything about it for weeks but we all knew what happened. One day I even asked if, guy that left, was on vacation or something. He just mumbled yeah something like that. Hoisted by his own petard. Okay, maybe not everyone left but, my mother-in-law got me involved into a charity. First I was a volunteer, then a secretary to the board and back to volunteer again. Things started changing. People who got on the board were no longer true to the organization's mission and at times ethically challenged. That is, using high school volunteers for the charity in a political campaign. Using artwork obtained through contests beyond scope of the contest rules without pay. Anyway, during one of the meetings, which was meant to be planning for a big annual event but was more like hazing to be honest. I asked myself why the heck am I allowing anyone to treat me like whipping girl? So I openly asked the board members if this tone is the new standard of the organization's interactions with people volunteering their time and talents to them. The president told me I was being impertinent and rude, and if I could not stand the heat to get out of kitchen. To which I replied that I quit volunteering. He told me then I had to submit my resignation in writing in order for it to be acceptable. I sat down, scribbled my resignation on a notebook page and presented him with it. He told me he won't accept it because it was not submitted according to the bylaws. I told him he was incorrect and reminded him I wrote the bylaws. They were too cheap to hire a lawyer to write them, and they clearly state that volunteer resignations do not require board approval. And I left. I was to pee to drive home. So I went to a cafe across the street. Few minutes later two other long time volunteers and all the high school volunteers walked in. They all did quit effective immediately as well. 
The annual event did not take place. The board was sued by the entity it was supposed to be solely supporting for mismanagement and misappropriation of funds. The charity later involuntarily dissolved by the state due to reporting failures. Custodian was appointed who allocated the remaining funds. In hindsight, it was the right time to jump the ship. For me best part was, the board let the insurance lapse. Guess who normally kept track of the renewals? So the legal expenses and part of the judgment went out of their own pockets. Talk about heat in the kitchen. Volunteer resignations do not require board approval. Good luck making an employee require employer approval to quit. Much less a volunteer position. What's one rule that your school workplace has implemented that absolutely backfired? During our general meeting last week, the owner of the company went on a bit of a rant about negative reviews of management on a popular jobs website with a green logo. He demanded that we stop posting negative reviews immediately and shamed anyone in the room who had done so. As you can guess, people doubled down and posted their grievances on the same day as the meeting. The green logo company doesn't take too kindly to that sort of behavior. Seriously, they will terminate service if management is caught doing that. Report it. Because of rumors of a drug problem in the school, there was. The administration decided to drug test students. The media jumped all over that. Violation of our civil rights or something. The initial statement was that anyone who failed the test would be kicked out of school. After the 40th or so kid failed they changed the policy to mandatory meetings with the counselor. After the 100th kid failed they hired another counselor. Our school just brought in drug sniffing dogs that would randomly come into classrooms. The thing was, the sheriff's department would always be parked in front of the school before the first bell with clearly marked K9 cars. So anybody who had drugs would see the cars and just skip school that day. Absences increased massively. My high school banned girls from wearing any shirt that exposed their bra straps because seeing a bra strap would give high school boys evil thoughts. Most of the girls in school responded by wearing the same shirts they'd always worn. Without bras, as a teenage boy it was a happy couple weeks. The school tried to then mandate that all female students wear bras. Until a male teacher asked a 15 year old if she was wearing appropriate undergarments or not. She called him a pervert. Her parents, who thought the whole dress code things was as stupid as most of the students, threatened a sexual harassment suit against the school. Everybody in charge panicked and it all went back to the way it was before they tried to change anything. Comma until a male teacher asked a 15 year old if she was wearing appropriate undergarments or not. This is my favorite tale of the thread. The thought of the awning chasm that open up beneath this rules are rules and makes me chuckle. My old boss tried implementing an incentive scheme for the underperformers while anyone who consistently did well received nothing. Three of us quit within a month. We used to be allowed to stream music etc on our computers. Spotify was an approved program and would come installed on your computer. Someone complained about productivity despite us always doing our work and so the banned streaming of any kind on our computers. But now everyone just listens on their phone so you walk around the office and nearly everyone has their phone out now so it looks even worse when sponsors come into the office. Yo, Pandora, Spotify, and YouTube are easily my best work friends. Banging out emails all day without listening to music would be borderline unbearable. Work instituted a points system for being late or calling off sick. Accrue too many points and you get written up. Fired if it continues. They doled out the same number of points whether someone was a minute late or called off altogether. And if an absence lasted up to 5 days, it was still only one absence. So anyone who overslept or encountered heavy traffic and was running late would just stay home. For the rest of the week, after several months, they decided that being late was only worth half a point. In our office, we're not allowed to have more than 14 consecutive days off. So one guy booked a cruise for a month, booked off 14 days, then one day back, then another 14 days off. He called in sick on his one day back. We weren't allowed to be friends with kids in grades above us, but we could be friends with kids in grades below us. That rule didn't last long. Turn to your left and shake hands with a person standing next to you. At an industrial site I used to work for, 
They introduced an absolutely no overtime policy. The people that most commonly worked overtime were the maintenance guys. They had to cut out their preventative maintenance in order to make their hours while being available for all shifts. It took 3 months of daily breakdowns before they decided to try something else. How more maintenance would be a good compromise to that rule? Boss insists that lunch time is from 12 o'clock 12.30 pm. No exceptions. Lunch is not paid time. The second day he comes in hot to trot with something for me to do between 12 o'clock and 12.30 and needs it done right away. I look over at my clock, which says 12.09 or whatever and say you said yesterday that lunch is from 12 o'clock to 12.30. No exceptions and went back to my sandwich. If I don't get paid from 12 o'clock to 12.30, there's no way in heck I'm working for free. College removed chairs in cafeteria so people wouldn't hang around. Now people just don't eat at the cafeteria, it's a ghost hall and most of the food is thrown away daily. Really sad. God forbid anyone socialize in a building of the college they're paying for while eating food they are also paying for. Lonadal a 14 school in Lonadal, MO, late 80s, early 90s, our fairly small, rural school went from K8. So, we split lunch times in our gym cafeteria. For some reason our school actually invested in a noise control system because we could apparently be quite loud during lunch and I guess the teachers got tired of trying to keep us kids quiet, itch, and eat. This new piece of equipment was mounted high on the wall and looked exactly like a stoplight. When it was green, we were free to talk. If it became yellow, we were to be careful of how much noise we made. If it turned red it would buzz loud. Like when the game clock runs out at a basketball game. Installing this thing almost immediately had the opposite effect they desired. It became a game to us. We would only get quiet in order to make it go back to green. Then, as a large group, we would progressively get louder. We would stall it out at yellow before surging our collective voices to make it hit red and buzzzz at which time we would all cheer, laugh and get quiet again to reset it to green. Good times. That's why they frown on putting breathalysers lizards in bars. Turns it into a competition. Any support call lasting longer than 25 minutes must be reported to higher ups for review. I.e. if you have too many, no matter if it's your fault or not, you get a disciplinary review. I implemented the rule of politely hang up on a customer as close to 25 minutes as you can and call them right back. I am sorry I am experiencing a small issue with my phone. Is it okay if I call you right back? Gotcha. Outgoing calls are not reported or recorded. It's amazing. Any software related to job, whether written inside or outside company time, belongs to the company, me. So if I write and release malware at home it's the company's problem? The clause was immediately removed. Outside company time, that has got to be illegal. My friend worked as a technician at a place that did installation for telecom, sound, cable, pretty much anything tech related really. The techs were paid by work order completion. Each job had a value that got paid out when you finish the work order. The experienced techs could finish more jobs in a day and made some seriously good money. They were motivated to work fast to get more jobs done, but also to do it correctly because having to go back within a certain time window and fix a problem didn't pay out so it lost money. Well some new management came in and decided to change everyone to hourly wages. Their idea to make techs focus on getting the job done right and not rushing it. All the really good techs saw massive pay cuts from it, and immediately quit. The rest of the techs suddenly had no reason to finish jobs quickly since you got paid the same whether you did 2 installs or 10 installs in one day. So everyone just started slacking off. Within a few weeks the orders were backed up so bad install dates were pushed out for a month or more. And when people finally did get their stuff installed it took all day instead of a couple hours. That one change completely fricked over the company. Nothing like greedy management to completely frick up a good thing. No cell phones in high school. Security collected them when you walked in, put them in ziplock bags, and locked them up. They lost like 5 people's phones. Lost. Had a fellow at my old place of work that was promoted to sales manager. Within a few days he drafts up a document which he tries to get all of us to sign basically stating that we aren't working to our full potential and that to make profit so we would have to work even when we weren't working. AKA taking calls from customers no matter the day or time. 
This resulted in an almost immediate revolt and about 10 plus people bypassing him directly and going right to the owner. He was demoted then later fired within a week. Pizza place I worked at in high school implemented a zero tolerance policy on employees taking home any food home that wasn't paid for at non-employee prices. Any screw ups or unpicked up orders trash. The local homeless population started flocking to the store and calling in bogus orders because they knew there would be free pizza in the dumpster every night. Our process integrity people decided every international order over $100,000 needed to be approved by a manager at the purchase requisition stage before the sales order could be processed. The problem? Purchase requisitions only generated after the sales order was completed. This meant it was impossible to complete any international order worth more than $100,000 and they launched this policy unannounced two days before Christmas. I ended up staying in the office until 9 at night trying to get our data people to create a way for me to order $300k in parts from Sweden before the holidays. I was told this story when I was in the army by a parachute rigger. The workday in the army is 9 o'clock 4.30. Riggers packing troop shoots had a daily quota of 35 shoots. Once they got good at it these guys could be done by 2.30, which is a very nice workday indeed. Well, they got this new captain who decided that since these guys are getting 35 done by 2.30 then obviously making them work until 4.30 would increase output even more. So of course that unit's numbers went wildly down and the 35 and you're done for the day was quickly reinstated. From another perspective, parachuters might have preferred when the riggers were taking their time rather than rushing through the process to leave early. No backpacks in the classroom which led to hundreds of backpacks in the principal's office one morning. No one gave a frick about that rule. In Germany you need a paper from your doctor when you are sick at least 3 days. They enforce that you needed one even if you just are away for one day. So everyone had to go to the doctor if not feeling right and of course we were away for weeks. We have the same here in Finland. My superiors accept that you call them if you have fever or something minor. One two days off and mark them as normal working hours. Rather than going to doctor and get one two weeks of sicklies. Works for me. Works for them. A big shipping company I worked at for a couple months said we would be working 7am to 4pm. They didn't tell all the new employees including myself, that holiday hours were going to be 7am to whenever the frick we feel like telling you to go home, around 10 to 11pm. Naturally, people would get in 5 to 7 hours of work and go on break, then just not come back. That led to we can no longer allow lunch breaks, me and roughly 50-70 other workers quit on the spot. The deputy head of our school banned fidget spinners. And rightly so, in his defense they were everywhere. On the final day of year 11, someone hacked his school intranet login and edited the bulletin, leaving a notice in his name, saying that fidget spinners were now not only unbanned, but mandatory, and that aficionados could come to his office and learn tips and tricks from him. Real world heroism. Stopped giving kickback for walk-ins sales. I work at a hotel and the high management had the bright idea not to give us anything for charging walk-ins, late checkouts, early check-ins and upgrades. So now we give them for free whenever we can. Then summer chat will leave that fear certified as they were and charged 4x after talking to Y in their TripAdvisor review. It was actually my rule. When I was managing a store, my rule was that the closer had to do all the closing work and mark the checklist and I would check it the following morning. However, I put a loophole in. If you close tonight and open tomorrow, you can come in early the following morning. I was really the only one who closed and then opened the following morning. And I knew that on many of those days I worked 10 hours with non-stop managerial work. So instead of staying late to clean, I like to come in early and do it in sunlight. Well, one day I followed my rule, and the next morning I woke up sick and had to call an employee to cover. He showed up to a dirty store, opted not to clean, and then got written up when the owner made a surprise visit. I didn't close so it wasn't my job and the owner said you work here and the store is dirty, so it is your job. I then had to go tell the owner that it was my fault and he still responded regardless of what you did or didn't do. He came into a dirty store and did not clean it. That's not acceptable. I removed my rule change and just made it mandatory to clean before leaving lol. 
A few years ago we weren't allowed to stand in groups bigger than four at our school because this old teacher told us it was gang behavior and encouraging gang violence. One day my entire year of like 100 plus people got in a massive group screaming gang gang and throwing gang signs on our school field so they had to bring every single teacher out to try and split us apart for a straight 20 minutes. Best school day ever. We did a mass hug around the flagpole then spent 3 days holding any hand of any person you walked by. This was after they told us we could not touch anyone. A nursing home in our area thought it would be a great idea to bring back the traditional white nursing caps. They made it mandatory for all female nurses to wear during their shifts or be written up, and eventually pointing yourself out. Male nurses were not included. About half of the staff quit within the first two weeks. Several started working at my facility. The others that stayed said that the residents and families of resident laughed and made fun of the nurses constantly. Pretty degrading and sexist comments. Basically about 3 months after this all went down someone from corporate came in and fired all the directors who implemented the uniform change and everything went back to normal. Several nurses stayed with my company but a few went back when the rules changed. Used to work in an inpatient treatment facility. One of the perks was that meals were provided to staff members. The new CEO decided that it was far too expensive to feed clients and staff and put the kibosh to it in an effort to trim the food budget. The food at this place used to be decent, with a competent cook who knew how to use fresh ingredients. Now the food provided is processed and gross. Last I heard, the cook quit and they have the handyman preparing meals. The kicker, the food budget has gone up because now the food is all pre-made frozen. The clients hate it and most of it goes in the trash. No swapping shifts without a shift swap form, immediately backfired when the manager had a stack of shift swap forms every day to approve and update the digital roster. My middle school tried to prohibit students from bringing backpacks into class you could bring a purse, bag, etc, however, just not a backpack. They wanted students to either stop by their locker before every class period, impossible without being late, or carry a large stack of heavy textbooks around all day. Due to the latter reason, the rule got cancelled within a week. This was in 1998-99, so I'm not sure what they were trying to achieve with this rule. One job I had had a nails should only be in neutral colors rule. Every rule was enforced rather strictly except for this one, because per the words of a manager, Every woman would get written up. Rule at my workplace WS that if you were late you had to bring donuts for everyone. People quickly figured out that the cost of being 4 hours late was to bring donuts. As a result, if you were running late you just had a slow easy morning and stopped by to pick up donuts on your way in. Our boss, who had put the rule into place, thought it was funny and just let it continue. He was an easygoing guy and really good at motivating people. Letting them get away with this sort of thing meant they stayed late or showed up after hours for emergencies. Not me, but my friend's old place. My friend was one to show up a half hour early before work and was a commission based salesman with salary. Just like the other salesman, who would always show up barely on time to hours late. Friday night comes along and management decides to hold a meeting to announce the new policy. If you're late, you go home for the day and if you're late 3 days a month, you're fired. The weekend goes by and everyone is on time. During the week, a few people call out sick right as the store opens. The weekend is coming up and my buddy is scheduled for Saturday, but not Sunday or Monday, and he's going to Disneyland with his wife, who has Saturday, Sunday and Monday off. Friday night he packs his wife's car. Saturday comes along and he's in the parking lot a half hour early. He pops in his favorite cassette, fires up a joint, and proceeds to hotbox his car. He walks in 5 minutes late, reeking of pot, looks at the clock, and then to his boss in front of the whole sales floor, and loudly says oops, I'm late, guess I need to go home with a crap eating grin on his face. The bosses started backpedaling the policy and started to tell him it wasn't for him and they'll let it slide. He loudly stated that it wouldn't be fair if they made an exception for him and that he would see them Tuesday. When he got back to work on Tuesday, the policy was gone. Same company years later hired some absolute genius of an accountant who sold the idea to management that employees were making more than management, and that they should go from commission to salary. All the top salesmen jumped ship ASAP. The reminding bottom feeders got a raise compared to their normal salary and commission. 
and they didn't have to do crap all day to get it. Less than a year later, they shut their doors for the last time. Jesus Christ. What fool thinks it's a good idea to completely remove the incentive for selling things? That's how you go from a place of business to Walmart FFS. One of top managers for my work decided that everyone who's worked there for 7 plus years had to do a special online training course that consisted of two 400 plus page volumes of leadership training followed by a 20, 25, question test for each volume. You were expected to complete this within one year of being automatically signed up for the course. Failure to pass the tests or to complete the course by the end of that year ended you ineligible for promotions and almost guaranteed to be laid off within a year. So many people tried to take the guaranteed severance package option by not doing the course that they had to change the rule that you wouldn't get laid off or not promoted, but you still had to do the course. People still didn't do it. That guy finally left shortly after and a new guy replaced him and promptly chucked that course and the whole idea of it into the garbage. When my school moved to a newly built site, they also tried to establish a new rule or set for a new generation or something. The first one, because they loved their fancy new building so much, was that nobody was allowed to leave the building until the end of the school day, including breaks. The front door would literally be locked unless there was a fire alarm. Suffice to say either nobody turned up or a lot of fire alarms were pulled before the rule was thrown away. There were also military style uniform inspections at random throughout the day, and they looked at us. I was in sixth form, to set the example for the kids. However, they were so overzealous and dictatorial that it became comical, and we all very quickly stopped caring and told them to send us home or get lost and stop treating us like trash. There were more stupid rules like this, but our first group of sixth form ended up tearing them all down in a couple of months. I didn't reach my sixth form until much older in life. Great work or sis. Phones should be stowed away in a box in the front of the classroom. Everyone was like, me, we'll see how it goes. In other words, number. Yeah, like I'd leave 800 pounds sitting in a box in the front of a classroom full of people still learning morals. Programmer here. Management implemented an agile work tracking system that measured programmers by the amount of feature requests they completed. We quickly figured out how to game that system by breaking everything down into the maximum number of feature requests we could imagine. We'd make separate feature stories for make new button, make button blue, make button respond when clicked, make new page for the new report, run business logic to get results, display results in grid, set font for grid, make grid sortable, make back button return to previous page. We became great at dividing a one day task into 21 hour tasks. Management loved it. Our team looked 20 times as productive and became an example to show off our process as the best performing team, despite producing far less actual work and more useless form filling. For some reason my department started a rule having to keep phones in their cars or locker. Eventually the supervisor said frick it cause no other department was told this. No n words in the Huck Finn. Our high school teacher made us buy the censored version for his class and numerous parents complained about the censorship as well as the added cost. Since our school library had sets of the original we could have read for free. It's history. Embrace it. Accept it. Don't repeat it. Oh gosh. In school back in the day we participated in a diversity driven activity carried out in the form of the wall of tolerance or something along those lines. Basically we had to write down stereotypes and put them up so we could tear them down. It ended up looking like the wall of racism. It was so bad. I'm just glad we didn't end up on local news. Way back in the antediluvian days of the 20th century, I worked as a government inspector in one of the larger US states. This was before the advent of government employee unions. Each fiscal year, the personnel department would come up with proposals for reimbursing employees for official travel, discuss it with an employee association, and send it to the state legislature for rubber stamping. One year, someone came up with the bright idea that travel reimbursement should cover more than overnight trips. Employees who were required to travel more than 25 miles from their headquarters should get a lunch allowance. My guess is that no one looked hard at the proposal. And those that did were thinking of staff who went to occasional meetings, not people who were on the road every day. Well, my agency had the state divided up into districts, 
Inspectors in the districts were on the road almost daily, in my case, it was a combination of overnight and day trips. It was pretty common to be more than 25 miles away from my office, and my colleagues and I discovered that it was easy to change pretty common to almost always. Multiply that by not only my own agency staff, but staff in every other agency that did field work. We cleaned up on the lunch allowances, the state budget for employee travel was completely blown before the year was half over, and, as soon as legally possible, the rule was changed to cover only specific emergency conditions. When I was in 8th grade, my school implemented a new iPad program. We were recognized as an Apple certified school or some bulls like that. The problem was that students were just using them to play games. Administration didn't have any way to crack down on it, and teachers had no clue how to implement it into the classroom. But we constantly played 2048 in class, since it was impossible for them to block all the different iterations for it, and when they made it an instant demerit to be found playing it. Even in lunch and homeroom, we just switched over to browser Tetris. It was so bad that one kid who sat right next to me didn't even try to focus on school. He would spend the entire period playing on his iPad, then constantly complain that he kept scoring 50s and 60s on his tests. Worst part of being a kid was not having adults take you seriously when you knew what you were talking about. What is an example of this that happened to you as a child? I once bought a game and when I opened it outside the shop it had no disc in it. I went back and they didn't believe me so I argued with them for at least 30 minutes before they tried to kick me out saying I was scamming them. After about an hour, they kept telling me to leave and get out of the way and trying to then ignore me. In total I got them to check the CCTV and the manager hadn't put the disc in the case. They were separate to stop thieves. Without a word he got a copy and threw it at me and stormed off complained about stomach aches every morning for a week and my parents thought I just wanted to skip school. The next weekend they wanted to set me straight so I was taken to the doctor. Turned out I had hepatitis A. One of my best friends committed for over a year and the doctors told him he was faking. It's anxiety. It's attention seeking. Massive brain cancer. Tried to tell them my knee was bothering me. Was told it's just growing pains. Finally go in about 2 years later, got a scope done, and doc says, man if we wouldn't have caught this earlier we could have avoided the surgery. I had a birthmark that was displaying all the classic signs of skin cancer but every time I tried telling my mum about the concerning symptoms, she brushed me off. She didn't even look. Eventually after 3-4 weeks I was taken to see a doctor and the situation then escalated very quickly. Long story short I ended up having a cancerous tumor the size of an orange removed from the area below my birthmark. The doctor had many stern words with my mother after that and I was monitored for a while. Not really as a child but when I was 14 I had severe side pain from a kidney stone and my parents didn't take my pain seriously until after a few days and by that time I was literally on my knees begging them to take me to the air. If your kid starts begging you to take them to the air, please listen to them. I begged my parents that we stop in Paris as we drove back to the UK from our holiday and whilst we were there we visited the Eiffel Tower. We parked nearby and from the top I could see our car being towed. I told my parents but they wouldn't listen. They thought I was joking and being young I assumed their response meant it wasn't a big deal. Luckily, our car was some 4x4 thing, not good with the breeds of cars, so the towing guys were still trying to move it. They told us to get out of the city ASAP as it was about to be locked down. Later in life I discovered on that day there was an assassination attempt on the French president. I remember being into space as a kid and telling my mum's drug addict boyfriend that the sun is a star. Dumsey refused to believe I was right. Fuck face. The sun is a star everyone knows that. When I was in middle school I needed glasses because I couldn't see the board. I told my parents. They said I was looking for attention. I brought binoculars to school so I could see. They didn't take me to an optometrist until the school nurse did rudimentary eye exams on every student in the school and wrote my parents that I needed glasses. Same thing happened with braces. My dentist had been hinting for years that I needed braces and they didn't take me to an orthodontist until he wrote a referral to one who was just down the street. I had had crooked teeth and an entire adult set for years at that point.
My sister faked bad eyesight when she was young, because of which they believed I was lying as well. It was only after every single teacher of mine said her child is blind that they got my eyes tested. I've been wearing glasses for 10 plus years now, and I can't see crap without them. In kindergarten we had different skills to learn and after learning each one there was a poster that we got to write our name on if we learned the skill. These were things like being able to tie our shoes or button a shirt. One was for if we knew our own birthday. There was a mix up and the teacher had my birthday written down for a different month. I knew my correct birthday, but was told I was wrong. Even after it was proven that I knew my birthday I still didn't get to put my name on the poster. Same but it happened with the spelling of my own name. Begged my parents to not send me to school as I wasn't feeling well. It was photo day so understandably they sent me because they thought I was lying to get out of it. Got the photos back and can see the chicken pox around my neck. That's kind of wild to me. I don't remember feeling at all ill from chicken pox. Just incredibly itchy. In the 6th grade I fell on my roller skates. I was sure I'd broken my wrist but my mother, a radiologist technician, the woman literally takes rays of broken bones for a living, told me I was just faking it for attention. A week later and it was still swollen. I couldn't write correctly, and my pay teacher wasn't letting me participate and he sent home a note that finally prompted my mother to take me into the doctor. Come to find out I definitely had broken my wrist and was in a cast for 8 weeks. Felt sick as heck but forced to go to school. Ended up throwing up and having severe food poisoning for the next few days. Those were some bad nights. It became a boy who cried wolf scenario for me. I would regularly try to fake being sick to get the day off from school and when I actually had a bad case of the shoots they wouldn't budge and I ended up spending half my school day in the nurse's room running between the bed and the toilet. My grandparents went to Australia for a year. Whilst they were gone my mother was asked to drop by to check on their house, but would often just wait in the car and have me go in. One time I noticed that the next door neighbors, who were building an extension, had taken down the dividing fence and put scaffolding into my grandparents garden. I told my mother, who brushed it off as imagination, the next time, they'd fully started to build on my grandparents land, destroying my grandfather's prized rhubarb patch. I told my mother, and same thing happened. By the time my grandparents came home the extension was fully built and had been for months. My grandma was so annoyed at my mother for not doing anything to stop this, but I think they were so kind. They didn't do anything about it and the neighbors got away with it. Dang shame if someone accidentally lit that extension on fire. Dang shame. And to think the owners are in Australia. Kindergarten. Needed to pee. Teacher. No you don't. Teacher. Five minutes later. Struggling to peel off my pea soaked stockings. Also kindergarten. Needed to throw up. Teacher. No you don't. Immediate result. Bright orange vomit on Christmas green carpet. To this day I find the obsession with preventing kids from going to the bathroom at school really fricked up. I'd always hoped it would make sense to me when I got older. But it doesn't. It's just messed up. Pretty sure I have mild to rates. Head and neck jerks at absolutely random times. And it's gotten progressively worse. Parents decide to mock me on it and apparently if I concentrate enough I'll be able to control it. It's been 2 years now and I still haven't gotten a diagnosis yet. I come from a family of doctors that mock you for getting sick or just in general having any medical issue. Could be an essential tremor. I've been looking into it recently and it sounds like what I've been dealing with too. I told my mom when my dad was abusing me and she didn't believe me, or didn't want to, and since that was exactly what he had said would happen if I told, I never tried again. Then when I told her again in my 20s after I cut him out of my life, she asked me over and over if I was sure, and didn't stop until her constant asking caused the worst panic attack I've ever had in my life. Thank you to the couple of people who will read this comment. It feels nice to know that somebody knows, and hopefully somebody believes me. I have always loved reading and I love to apply what I'd learnt about writing techniques, spelling and grammar to my schoolwork. We had a substitute teacher for a while in primary school who once read penned, marked as wrong, my work for using the punctuation combo and the word accumulative. 
She also didn't believe me when I wrote about foxgloves being poisonous to many animals and wasn't interested in seeing the botanical book that proved it. Ignorant much. I'd love to see what she shares on Facebook. Okay, not really. I was maybe 4 or 5 years old and my mum took me with her to run errands. We ended up at the mechanic where my mum was getting her car repaired. She places me on the counter. I tell my mum I don't feel well mum. She ignores me. I tell her again mum I don't feel very well. She waves me off, disregards me, and takes out her credit card to pay. I pipe up once again mum I don't fee. I throw up on the counter. Child vomit all over the counter. The clerk turns to my mum and says oh, is she not well today as my poor mother picks up a dripping credit card. Number. I don't think she is, replies my mum. Still processing what just happened. A fun mixture of disgust and surprise on her face. Power to her. She never disregarded me or ignored me ever again after that when I told her I felt sick so there's that at least. That my parents were abusive. All their friends thought they were just normal people. It wasn't until my mom had a mental breakdown from me moving away and cutting contact because she couldn't control me anymore that people started to realize that maybe they were a bit abusive. Still to this day I get a few oh they weren't that bad or they did it because they love you from random people who had good childhoods and couldn't even possibly wrap their narrow bone. Headed minds around the fact that a parent of anyone can be abusive. I would constantly feel sick after every breakfast and lunch at school. My stomach would hurt so badly and I would have to go to the bathroom. I just knew something was off. I told my mom and asked to go to the doctor and she said it's fine. It's just anxiety. I lost 12 pounds and found out at my annual physical for school that I have celiac disease and my small intestine was just destroyed. I tried using a second hand reclining chair we just got and it collapsed around me. I was still small enough to get wedged in the pieces. Called out for help as I was stuck in the chair and all I got was if you want to talk to me come here and speak properly spent an hour in a chair. Fun. My mom was convinced earthworms were the same as parasitic worms and called me a rude smart butt when I tried to explain that the earthworm I was holding was not gonna burrow under my skin. I tried explaining to my mother that not all snakes, especially the ones at zoo, are not poisonous and they do not want to kill everything it sees. She still fears them and calls me smart butt. When I was 5 or 6 I was looking down on the balcony when I felt wind on my left ear and saw a solid freaking red brick falling and then crashing on the floor to dozens of pieces. I immediately look up and saw my neighbor with his brother, 15 yo at that time, laughing there off. When I told my parents they laughed and told me that I watch too much cartoon. They still don't believe me 25 years later. Your neighbor's brother is a dong. Growing up I noticed I couldn't hear properly. Became more apparent when my mum was hoovering up and I only needed to cover one ear. Parents didn't believe me. Teachers didn't believe me they just said I wasn't listening. I was in high school when my parents realized there might be a problem. The doctor said it was common for kids to fake it for attention and my parents could try clearing my ears out. Another two years before a doctor did a full check and found that I was completely deaf in one ear and mostly deaf in the other with likelihood of going fully deaf and they cannot find the actual cause. It's essentially a natural degradation of my ability to hear and it's likely genetic since my gran on my mother's side also had it starting with the left ear same as me. My mum on the other hand has a degradation of sight starting in her left eye and apparently she was just terrified of me being deaf because it would be her fault. Grade 2 teacher initially refused to let me do a diorama on the epoch for an animal project because she didn't realize it was an actual animal took me bringing in a printed article on it to convince her to let me do it. To be fair to her though, I didn't use its more well known name of the water opossum. To be more fair, I've still never heard of it. Tried to tell my mum that she was in a horribly abusive relationship. It had been 8 years, by that point. They would regularly fight and she'd take me round to my grands, her mother, for a few days. She'd always say this time I won't go back and I'd say yes you will. I was miserable, and I never gave up trying to tell her to leave. She told me that because I was only a teenager, my brain was still developing and that I was literally incapable of empathy. I had never known love. I would understand when I was older. Anyways now I'm nearly 30 and I haven't spoken to her in years. 
my siblings had built a wild E. Coyote ladder of random stuff from our backyard to get to the roof so they could jump from the roof onto our trampoline. I asked if I could do it but being like 6 they said no, that I would get hurt. And because I was 6 I decided this was grounds to tattle. I went straight inside and told our parents exactly what was going on and it was so ridiculous that not only did they know believe me, they didn't even bother checking. They wouldn't find out for another 7 years when I brought it up again as a fun memory during dinner. Let me guess, when your parents finally did check, the ladder had already disappeared because of an evil scientist which was intended to help take over the tree state area. My family was the I went to school no matter how sick I was, so you will two types. But they were also the we can't take time off or we might get fired and it's illegal to leave you at home types. Which also goes hand in hand with the prescription medicine is expensive, and if you don't go to the hospital, you'll get better and save us some money types. I don't know what the heck I had, but I think it was some kind of lung infection, bronchitis or something, no idea. I think I did end up getting some pills over the weekend so I wouldn't have to stay home on Monday. The school wasn't happy, lol. In 7th grade we had to do a report on the Revolutionary War and include different items. One was a poem that I had fun writing, and the teacher liked it and read it to the class when we were doing research in the library. Afterwards the librarian came up to me and said tell your dad it was a good poem with a tone that implied he thought my dad wrote it for me. Another teacher didn't believe me and pay running laps that, out of shape me, couldn't breathe. She told me to keep going. I tried but ended up hyperventilating and twisted my ankle. She finally let me sit down. The librarian portion makes my blood boil. What a miserable butthole. One time I was like 13 and I spent an entire afternoon cleaning a pool for a pool party a family friend was having. When I'm just finishing up some random guy shows up and says oh look at the kids having fun and pretending they're being helpful. I'm 29 and still salty about it. Honestly, I would be too. I've got a master in electrical engineering. My parents, until recently, refused to let me fix things. A professional should do it. Like WTF did you spend all that money on my education for? I was home sitting for two weeks and when they returned, I had repaired several things that were bothering me. I tend to stay there a lot. My mother was genuinely impressed with something she should have known to be true for more than 10 years. Now she actually asks me to fix stuff. Same with computers here, although mostly my grandparents that still don't trust me after 7 years of computer science, they also still try to understand virtually every button I press so the one time I did help them it took hours of explaining. My mom never believed me when I said we shouldn't water our indoor plants every day, especially not in winter. Three pots of dead plants later, she might have started to come around, but I kinda hated her a little more by then. Begging my parents for help with my mental health at age 12 I knew I had anxiety and depression I told my parents and they shrugged it off. It took a suicide attempt for them to realize it wasn't anything they could ignore. I had the same experience, and my mom's response was I can't deal with this right now in a condescending way. Fast forward 11 years and I'm good now. I made two attempts in that time span, but I still haven't forgotten about that. It sucks to not be listened to when you need it most. In primary school, we had a quiz, year 5 versus year 6, I was in year 6, age 10. One question asked was which was the first motorway built in the UK. My older brother had told me this bit of trivia only a few weeks prior so I raised my hand immediately and say the M6. I was told I was wrong and then year 5 answered with the M1 and was told they were correct. I was initially confused thinking my brother, who always knew random trivia and was never wrong about things like this, must have got it wrong, or told me wrong. I protested but to no avail and my classmates mocked me for getting the question wrong. I went home that day and asked my brother who confirmed that it was the M6 Preston Bypass. This was before internet was readily available so I wasn't able to say for certain, but my brother was the authority on this sort of thing. So I was confident I was correct and now more annoyed at the teachers. Went into school the next day and a teacher came up to me and apologized and said I was right. They looked it up afterwards. Shame they only said that in private and not with the rest of the class listening and finding out that I was actually right. 
Me telling my father that standing up to and fighting the school bully is the worst idea ever. I ended up getting stabbed in the crotch on the school bus. To be honest, it's generally the better idea to stand up, while avoiding to ridiculize him or anything that could cause retaliation. If you don't react, they will continue picking on you forever. I stuttered a lot as a kid so no one ever knew what I was talking about. I got bullied by students, teachers, staff members, my brothers and their friends, even my own freaking parents who thought discipline would help instead of actually helping. I will always remember my mum saying Jesus, will you stop doing that stupid I, 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 I thing? It's really freaking annoying. <laughs> Fell on my arm when I was 12 13 hurt like heck. Got told to quit the whining. Four days later it still hurt whenever I tried to use my hand. Day 5 at the doctors they told me I had broken a bone in my wrist. I do not whine anymore though. I have a rare genetic disorder that causes tumors in the smooth muscle that contracts pores. My first and most aggressive patch of tumors cropped up on my leg when I was 12. They are very visible and very painful. I showed them to my mom, and she was like, Oh you're just being self conscious because you're getting older. That's just acne. I continued to complain about this same patch of tumors for several years. I was not taken to a dermatologist until I was 17. My mom being satisfied with a vague diagnosis and an overpriced foaming ointment, which has zero effects on actual tumors. I was not properly diagnosed until I was 19. After a year of the tumors being blamed on me not properly using the ointment, and a year of me living abroad, unfortunately the only way to deal with the first and largest patch would be for me to have a skin graft. So far in my adult life I have not had time for this. I definitely could have managed it as a kid had I been diagnosed at 12. I am 27. I am in pain daily. Parents in their 50s, both in poor health decided to build a new house, in a crappy area, instead of taking my advice to buy an existing house in a nicer area popular beach suburb, I found nice places on the internet and took a day to drive them both around to inspect, instead they dropped 500k on a newly built double story townhouse, around the corner from social housing, no walk to beach, no walk to shops, complaints about unsavory characters in the area, inability to climb stairs due to back injury that's been a problem since 1983. To cap it all off, they asked me to sell my things, car, horse, partners cat etc, because they needed the money because the pension didn't pay much. They failed to plan for their future. I reported to my parents, and anyone who'd listen, that a big bulge had developed in the bottom of the water tower atop the hill above our neighborhood. They just smiled and said I was too young to know what a bulge is and that it was just part of the structure. Shortly thereafter, the water tower burst, unleashing a torrent of water and flooding the neighborhood below. When learning to drive, my parents had this thing where revving the car past 3000 revolutions per minute was somehow hurting the car or being reckless. Do you know how gutless cars used to be? A 92 1.6L Corolla is one example. Plus they only ever had manuals, so they would be constantly laboring the engines and only shifting down when absolutely necessary. But I was the one thrashing the cars. Note, it's not like I was chasing the red line or anything, but a small 4 cylinder car needs some spin to get up hills man. That I didn't trust my head teacher when I was in primary school and that I didn't feel well when at that school. It was due to anxiety. I fast forward to the age of 17. I now know that the head teacher threatened to lock a kid with Down syndrome in a cupboard. She has a kid with Down syndrome. She covered up a teacher locking an autistic kid in a cupboard. She's reported my family, along with many others, to social services because my parents were causing my brother to cry all the time. He had a diagnosis of IBS and his tics. He has two rate TTEs, were incredibly painful and no one believed that he had two rate TTEs at that school, even after it was diagnosed. Same with the IBS. They also reported my family on the basis that they caused my autism and that my younger sister, she's autistic, was showing signs of copying elder brother. Basically they gaslighted my parents when they treated my brother horribly. I had left at this point. I'm now on medication for life to sort my anxiety, depression, and stress. My parents feel so guilty that they didn't listen to me when I begged to be homeschooled. I'm now home educated, regardless of the pandemic, 
and going on to my levels. They get emotional whenever I bring up my time at primary and now listen and take me seriously. One night when I was sleeping, I heard some movements in my house. I freaked out and called my parents, who were sleeping in the next room. But they didn't listen to me and thought that I had a bad dream. The next day we woke up to find that our house had been burgled. I was a paranoid kid and complained to my parents about leaving doors unlocked at night but we were in a safe area and I shouldn't watch so many crime shows they said. Took my mom's purse being stolen one night for them to listen. Honestly lucky it was just stuff and not way worse. I was 10 and it was like 3am. I was sleeping alone in my bedroom when I heard a knock on my window. I was too scared to check so I hid in my blanket. But the knock won't stop. Then I quickly ran to my parents bedroom to tell them about the knock. They came with me to check but the knocking sound was already gone. My parents told me that it was probably nothing and I was imagining things. So I went up to bed again but this time I left the light on. Literally 2 minutes after my parents left, I heard another knock on the window, but this time the light were on and I saw the face of a man looking at me. I immediately ran to my parents bedroom and told them what I saw but this time they didn't believe me. My parents closed the window and the curtains and instead turned on the air conditioning, then went back to sleep. The knocking stopped but I still didn't sleep that night. Sorry for my bad English. Your English is better than mine. Coming from a native English speaker. What's the edgiest thing you've ever done to make yourself look cool but that actually made you look stupid? When I was deep in my emo phase I got the webbing of my hands pierced and then cried when my dad had to remove them with his tools 2 weeks later then both my hands were so infected I could barely move my thumbs. I used to be sunglasses indoors and at night guy. Okay, Corey. I was a mall goth in high school. And when I wasn't dressed head to toe in hot topic gear, I would wear bizarre mismatched outfits, carried an invaders in lunchbox as a purse, wore cat ears to school, oh my god, and pants under skirts. God, this is so relatable that it hurts. I really liked pants under skirts though. I had few skirts that were too short for school dress code that I used to wear over my jeans. I also wore mismatched Chuck Converse sneakers. One black, one orange. The orange was duct taped together at the toe. People used to tell me daily that my shoes didn't match. Tried to jump a fence and I ended up clearing it but something like my shoe or shoelace got caught and I ate crap in front of all my friends. When I was maybe around 16, I wanted to have a cool anime facial scar so I deliberately cut myself down the bridge of my nose and between the eyes. Over the course of a week or so it bled, scabbed over, then disappeared without a scar. The art is to have a deep wound that is treated badly and heals badly. In case anyone read this, don't do it. You'll look more like a car crash survivor than like your favorite anime character. Except it's a car crash survivor. I used to wear two rings in middle high school. Both on my right middle finger. One ring had a skull with axes. And the other was some ancient rusted thing I found when I was a small child that had one dark green gem left in it. And no one was impressed. Comma some ancient rusted thing I found when I was a small child that had one dark green gem left in it. That actually sounds really cool. I met a kid in a trench coat at a college party who told me his friends call him nails because he doesn't screw around. Then he looked at me for a few seconds in silence and we both walked away. When I was around age 10, I thought it was the coolest thing ever to wear my bangs in front of my eyes like an anime character. Like both eyes. I couldn't see and it wasn't cool. When I, 24, M, was younger, around 12, 14, I was alone at home one day. I lit a candle at some point and started playing around with the melted wax. It was a white candle. I don't know how I got to doing that, but I started applying the melted wax to my face. I was using my hands and by the time it touched my face it wasn't unpleasantly warm anymore. I covered my whole face with thin layer of wax and I thought of the movie House of Wax and how tough creepy I must look. I took a selfie with my crappy camera, was 10 years ago, and I figured I ought to share it with the world, so I uploaded it to this teen dating website I was visiting. It never got approved. Later it hit me how it looked and why it was not approved. I'm glad it didn't. Although at the time I was disappointed, I won't elaborate further but the picture did not look creepy in the way I hoped. 
It took me a second to realize it looked like someone came on your face. I remember one lunch break in high school just sitting in the rain during some depressive phase and I'm pretty sure I thought it made me look brooding. But in actuality it was just really stupid because I got drenched halfway through the school day. I'm sorry but I read depressive face as depressive fart and laughed a bit. For about 3 years, I wanted my hair to be spiky, like I saw in some cartoons or anime shows. Not in vertical spikes, but more like claws instead of bangs. At least that's what I thought of them, and that's what I thought looked cool. I had almost forgotten about this. Thanks Reddit. Thy past sins shall not be forgotten. Smearing black dark grey eyeshadow all over my eyelids when I was 13. Looked like a freaking idiot. I was also homeschooled at the time lol. Probably creeped out the neighbor kids. I thought eyeliner was meant to cover the entire eyelid as a kid, and my mother let me go out like that. In elementary, I wanted to be a badass so I convinced my mom I had to wear a full suit for grade 6 class pictures, pulled up totally out of my element and deeply regretting it. I panicked and told everyone my mom forced me to do it, my teacher made me stand where he whirled stood and sat with the rest of the kids. Very uncomfortable day but totally brought on by my own need to be edgy and cool. My school had a uniform but there was always one guy who dressed like he was going to a funeral on casual clothes day. Reading these comments makes me realize what a profoundly negative impact Naruto had on the budding social lives of so many innocent children. Great show to watch. Terrible to use as a blueprint for being cool. Tried to spike my hair, didn't work out all that well and instead of looking like a UGIMC I just looked like I had majorly sticky bedhead. My grandpa's deck has no pathetic cards, Kaba, but it does contain the unstoppable Exodia. Not super edgy, but I would always do stupid dares like run directly into a brick wall at full speed or jump off of a small cliff, 1520 FT, or run and jump into a patch of thorns and poison ivy, stupid stuff that no one else had the balls to do. There's always that one friend in a group. OMG, chili, I went a variety of things, one show more cleavage, two emo stage, wear all black even my lipstick and eyeshadow. 3, and I used to draw teardrops under my eyes, and come to find out, that was a gang sign, but I saw Ice Cube with it and that it was an awesome look, until people kept telling me that I look real dumb. Yeah, the teardrop is probably something you don't want to fake. I wore spastically printed Avril Lavigne Abbey Dawn pants, a skin tight tee, furry vest, and black knockoff Uggs to school. I had also just messily chopped off my hair. I topped all this off with a garishly fake lip ring and a singular fishnet glove. I thought I was a punk rocker, a lashina. I looked like a proper idiot. So I first glanced at this and thought I read Avril Lavigne near Downton Abbey and was really curious as how one would combine the looks. Redhead here, streaked my hair black, resulted in being called Spalding by co-workers, was box dye, it lingered for a long while. Also a redhead. I tried semi-permanently streaking my hair blue and pink. The blue washed out immediately. The pink stayed for months. Pink and ginger. Not a good mix. Currently 15 and trying to grow out my hair to be really long. I'll come back to this in a few years when I can cringe at this. This is an uncomfortable level of self-awareness. I definitely wore a homemade floor-length black cape to high school a few times. Also sprayed myself grey to look like a ghost on spirit day, because apparently I knew there was no chance I'd ever fit in and decided to embrace it. I can hear some pimple faced teen shrieking hey guys cape guy painted himself. In 8th grade I saw the anime movie Akira and thought a satin jacket with the sleeves rolled up and a pair of snow gloves would make me look like a badass. Yep. Many a young weeb fell for that trap. This was way before I developed a sense of fashion and my outfits were horrible on every aspect. I started dressing more in dark clothes and constantly dyeing my hair when I was around 12-13. One time I wore a black and white gothic Lolita skirt with an ugly plain black top to school. And don't forget the stupid hat I wore with the outfit, 
It had cat ears, enormous eyes, and whiskers on each side. This idiot look was completed with wonky thick eyeliner, which was my first time ever using eyeliner too and it did not look good. Thank god I didn't continue down the gothic Lolita path. It's so expensive. Now I just go with regular emo, less expensive and way more comfortable. I will have been friends with you. That hat sounds amazing. I used to wear a fedora and my t-shirts were all Rick and Morty themed. Luckily I found Reddit and what a neckbird was, so I cut that out pretty quick. You sound like a guy I met at university once. Oh so many in middle school. 1. Tried having bangs. My front hairs grow straight up and part strongly in the middle. I had to hairspray them into a shield to get them to stay. But sadly I had gym first period and immediately they would part in the middle and stick straight up the whole day. 2. Let my mom wax my eyebrows because everyone waxed their eyebrows. My mom loved skinny eyebrows back then and waxed mine into tiny lines that were separated from one another by 2 inches. I look sick in so many photos during middle school because my eyebrows were seemingly non-existent lol. 3. Shaved one of my arms and hand in entirety. I have more than average hairy arms and hands. More hairy than my fiancés at the moment. I used to hate it so I tried to shave one arm to see if it looked better. It was so prickly and I was so nervous a cute boy would bump into me and find out I shaved it. Let's just say I learned not to fight my natural hair growth the hard way. I was the kid that was really into paper clips. In 5th grade I would stretch one out and fit it around my teeth like a crappy retainer to make it look like I had braces. Then in 8th grade I stuffed them through my ears like makeshift gauges. I thought I was super edgy and cool but in reality I was just a skinny dorky girl with paper clips in her ears. I used to wear silver eyeshadow around my eyes. Top and bottom. With no other makeup. It took me 2 years to realize how strange I looked. Alien but make it fashionable. Trying like an butthole to be a cool kid in high school. Didn't want to smoke, drink or do drugs. So I thought my thing would be pornography. I found some of my dad's hustlers and penthouse mags and brought a couple into school to show my friends. Word got out, a teacher confiscated them, and I did not end being cool. I got the reputation as a pervert. Luckily my dad never found out, the school did not notify my parents. Guess they thought their humiliation was punishment enough and I was only at that school for another year before moving. You wouldn't have gotten a reputation as a pervert in my school. There's literally a kid who pulls down his pants in science class and just sits in the back of the room in his underwear. Freshman year of high school I dyed my hair pink, green and blue. I get stared at in public anyway so I figured I may as well give folks something to stare at. It was truly cringeworthy but I thought it was edgy. I was a stupid kid. Or, hey, that doesn't sound too bad. You were just trying to rebel against being treated badly. My friend Pepper sprayed herself in the mouth to look cool. You're fine. <laughs> OMG. In 6th grade I had a little BF. We were in band together and were at our end of year concert. I distinctly remember being told that after getting up to bow we'd go off stage because concert was over. I was always a nervous little thing worried I'd do the wrong thing even after being told how to do it so I was one of those kids who'd wait for other to move before doing anything. Having a boyfriend all of a sudden gave me confidence. So instead of my usual waiting for someone else to move first I stuck my nose in the air and started to walk off stage while doing what I thought was a coy over the shoulder look towards him as I passed him. He wasn't even looking so I obviously took offense to that and turned a little more to tell my friend, who sat next to me, only to see no one was following me and they were all motioning for me to go back. Apparently I misheard, or misremembered, because we weren't supposed to walk off stage. We were supposed to sit back down and wait for each row to stand and bow, and then wait for official dismissal. I scurried back and sat down red in the face and embarrassed a high heck. Apparently though my row was the only one who noticed how I walked off. I mentioned to my parents how embarrassed I was for walking off and they had no idea what I was talking about. Nor did my teacher when I apologized the next day. I still think about it every now and then though. I feel you on the last sentence. The awkwardness PTSD is the worst. 
I have bangs that cover one of my eyes and had one red eye contact that I put my bangs over. I don't do that anymore but I'm still too lazy to cut my hair I really have to cut it since I've been assumed to be an emo girl for the last 3 years of my life. Since I basically look like a girl in every way. And I'm getting tired of it so if I cut my hair it's reduced the chances of me being assumed to be an e-girl. Anyone remember the emo trend of taking a black and white selfie and editing in a big X over the mouth? Well, I did that with a black Jim Beam label. I also had the headline hello, my name is Twilight C, and I'm an alcoholic, on my MySpace. I was 14. I dyed my hair what was meant to be a shocking blue, but it turned out kinda turquoise, and the semi-permanent dye never fully washed out, leaving me with hair that looked like it had mold for months. Not me, but a student I taught. He was 14. The kids were on a 10 minute bathroom stretch break. I taught them for a block of 2 hours straight, and a boy comes running into the classroom and says Ms. Hep 632, K is in the bathroom and he's bleeding all over. I ask what happened, and apparently K was showing the boys that he had pierced his own scrotum with a safety pin. They didn't believe it was a real safety pin, so he pulled it out, and apparently that's when the bleeding commenced. I cannot speak to the actual amount of blood, because I solicited the help of a male teacher to deal with K's nutsack. Bruh. I wore a purple Yuri Doki Doki wig and all black. Needless to say that didn't go too well. I just got laughed at. Parents thought I was dumb. L-E-X-H-A-L-F. D-E-M-O-N 1-3-H-A-T-E-S-H-U-M-R-N-I-T-Y-P-R-E-N-T-S-D-I-E-D-S-I-N-G-L-E-E-Y-E-S-T-U-R-R-N-B-L-C-K-W-H-E-N-M-
Arrow completely missed the target. Bowstring got caught on my arm guard and the pain from that made me drop my bow, breaking one of my stabilizers as it hit the ground. The way it broke left the screw portion inside my riser and had to get it removed by a professional. Told people I wanted to be a vampire. Told people I had a girlfriend who died so they would stop saying nobody would ever want to be seen with me. Soon after I got my reputation as a compulsive edgy liar. Nice. Divorce lawyers of Reddit. What plot twists or crazy antics or demands have you seen go down from either spouse? Took the couple 2 hours to decide who would get the groceries left in the fridge. Estimated value of the groceries was around $40. 2 hours of my time, opposing counsel time, and mediator time added up to about $1000. It all came down to a Costco Sam's Club sized jar of peanut butter. Who keeps peanut butter in the fridge? This is what happens when you negotiate on an empty stomach. I had a couple arguing for 3 hours over who got the kids on Christmas day, only to discover at the end that they were both Jewish. I had another woman who said that her husband drained 60k dollars from their community bank account to pay for a sex change operation that he never told her he was planning to do. I hate it when I find out I'm Jewish. I was a clerk for a law firm in Marin County. The husband grew weed in the house. The town was supportive and even let him redo his electrical panel to accommodate his crop. Long story short, in the divorce, she demanded half of the weed proceeds. Today it doesn't seem like a big deal, but 12 years ago I was shocked to see that in a court document. My dad was a divorce attorney for some time. He said people would argue over $150 patio furniture for hours on end at a $300 HR rate, each side. It's not about the patio furniture, it's about sending a message to your B of an ex-husband wife. I had a case where the estranged wife was calling my client's employer repeatedly, accusing him of theft and other white collar crimes, to try getting my client fired. The thing is, the children were with her, and she was also demanding child support, which is based on his income, for the job from which she was trying to get him fired. Fortunately, the employer was onto her BS and my client wasn't let go. The ex-wife hid his artwork, works he had purchased long before the marriage, and in mediation she tried to sell it back to him. And then. Not necessarily a crazy divorce story, but my dad is a lawyer and his friend has been married three times so my dad has been his divorce lawyer twice and his best man three times. I love serial grooms brides. I have an uncle who has been married so many times, five, that his own parents didn't even travel to his last two weddings. Grandma, I'm so excited to see you at Pete's wedding. Sorry, kid, I've got a bowling tournament that weekend and I've seen him get married plenty of times. My now ex-stepmother was getting an 80 stroke 20 settlement and refused to agree until the agreement was revised include a bag of old beer can koozies and a dry rotted pool float. She was crazy which is why dad was paying her to go away. I'm not a lawyer, but this is a story about my uncle and it's quite brilliant. My uncle has been a lifelong videographer and still works to this day as a news photographer. During the early to late 90s he stopped shooting news and started shooting freelance. This was before everyone and their mom, and their moms, had a camera editing software whatnot. Eventually he became a sought after photographer. In the 80s when he was working as a news photographer he met and married a reporter news anchor of which he would go on to have two children with. After leaving the news business to freelance he decided to start a video editing business with his wife. That went extremely well for a while and they were making money hand over fist. He would be asked to shoot for channels such as Food Network and HGTV, DIY, ETC and then edit it into the show. She would work as the middle, woman, for his clients and as bookkeeper. Eventually she would turn out to be a secret substance abuser and adulterer and their marriage ended in divorce. At this point my uncle was making a couple 100k a year with their business. She decided to sue him for alimony, mostly because he was worth a good chunk of change, but also because she helped him build his business. Her demands were ridiculous. Something like 75% of the business for the next so many years or something crazy. My uncle's lawyer was afraid she was going to win because she had played such a big role in building the biz. Fast forward to court day, her lawyer stands in front of the judge and lists off what she wants in the divorce. Once he is finished it's my uncle's turn. 
he blindsides her and offers to give her 100% of the business. The judge and both lawyers are confused and ask him if he is sure. Without him shooting and editing there is no business. So basically she would be left with a heck of a lot less than she asking for by asking for X amount of profits. The judge reasoned that his offer was fair and that she could take it or leave it. She was P. Her lawyer was P and she ended up getting nothing haha. <laughs> TL. DR. My uncle started a biz with his wife. She turned into a cheating drug addict. Divorce. She wanted X percent of profits from biz and divorce. He offers her the entire business. Total awesome dong move. He is a photo editor so she can't do crap with biz because she isn't a photo editor. But she gets nothing. Your uncle is a genius. I love to read stories like this. I was in a mediation where it took the couple an hour and a half to split their personal property, retirement accounts, real property, and custody of their 6 month old son. The rest of the day, about 4 hours, was spent arguing about how to split the time with the dog. For the kid they just put, as agreed upon by the parties but the dog had a strict calendar schedule working out holidays and strict pick up drop off times. I was ashamed to be a part of that unbelievable display. My parents stayed together for years because they couldn't agree on who got the dog when they divorced. They announced to my brother and I that they were divorcing the day we had to put the dog down. My friend's ex-husband tried to force their daughter to have to choose which parent she would live with every year on her birthday. The daughter wanted to live with mom. Dad is always out of town for work anyway. The judge told him that in no way was he going to force this girl to disappoint one of her parents every year on her birthday. Her ex-husband is a dong. Not a lawyer but I work in a law office. We had a guy who cheated on his wife transfer all of his money, slowly over time, to his girlfriend before the wife found out about their affair and filed for bankruptcy to avoid having to give his now ex-wife anything in the divorce. That dissipation of marital assets in the court would have ordered it returned. Also, bankruptcy judge has no authority over division of marital assets, child support, etc. Not a divorce attorney but I clerked for a judge that handled divorce cases. We had a couple that were both lieutenant colonels in the air force. They had one daughter that was about 11 or 12. Both had graduate degrees and were generally intelligent people. Well the husband had an affair and things went sour with the relationship. The daughter was at that age when her relationship with the mother was starting to get a little strained and she mentioned how she wanted to stick with her dad because he was about to be stationed elsewhere and the parents would be going there. Separate ways. The mother absolutely freaked. The first thing she did was go to the local police department and claim the father had been molesting and raping the daughter. They investigated and couldn't find any evidence so they dropped the case. The mother still furious then goes to the Air Force Office of Special Investigations and reports the same thing. The Air Force then suspends the husband from duty and conducts their own investigation. Same result no evidence of wrongdoing and the case is dropped. The mother then goes to the next state over where the husband is about to be transferred and contacts the local police there with the same story about molestation and rape. They of course do their own investigation but same result. Case is dropped. Of course this whole time the daughter has been interviewed a dozen times by psychologists, various therapists, the police, the air force, and who knows else. The daughter is straight up traumatized by this. People constantly asking her if her dad had been touching her raping her and so forth. Not to mention the harm it did to her father's career. He was basically screwed from any possible promotion just because of the allegations. As well as the fact that infidelity in the military is a big no no. But that was his own doing. Well once word of all this gets back to the judge he is furious. He's a former Air Force Jag and still has contacts in the ranks. Well anyway the couple comes in front of him one day for a hearing and he outright tells her she better stop this behavior or he is going to hold her in contempt of court for the maximum amount of time he can lawfully hold her in a cell. Contact the DA and recommend the filing of charges. Contact her Air Force superiors and recommend reprimand to the fullest extent possible, and basically anything and everything he can do within his power. It was one of the most messed up things I've seen during my relatively short experience in the legal world. Surely she belongs in jail for such repeated, extreme slander. When my parents got divorced, 
My dad had written in the divorce decree that my mother could not make any religious decisions for me, including regular church attendance, baptisms, etc. My mother was raised Mormon and my father was pretty adamant that I would not be raised in that religion too. As a lawyer who did a stint in high asset divorce law this is pretty standard. I've written this clause into settlement agreements a lot. A father and his friend go to pick up his child for some time together. He rings the buzzer of the apartment. No reply. He phones too. No answer. This is odd. Because he is there at the scheduled time and the mother never misses an opportunity to claim that he doesn't care about spending time with his child and that he routinely misses scheduled times together. The father and the friend figure that's odd. Let's walk around back to the parking lot to see if her car is still here. They go around to the back to find the mother and child sneaking down the back stairs to leave the building. The child sees the father, yells hi. Daddy then turns to his mother and says see, I told you dad was coming to see me today. I was a clerk for a family court judge. We had a woman try to get an injunction to keep the father from taking the daughter on a trip to Disney World to play in a concert. It was sad. This is a true story and it happened in New Jersey. Guy getting a divorce becomes suspicious and insanely jealous that his separated wife is having an affair. He secretly follows her to a bar and waits outside in his car. She comes out many hours later in the dark and follows another car to a house. Husband follows her, staying back, and parks down the block. He gets out, sees the house her car is parked at, and goes around into the backyard. He's sneaking around looking in windows and finally opens a sliding glass door and enters the house. His wife and the guy she is with hear him moving around, lock the bedroom door, and call 9 one, one. He starts pounding on the bedroom door and shouting at his wife, and then the cops kick in the front door. The cops get everyone downstairs to sort this out. That is when the guy realized for the first time his wife was sleeping with his own divorce lawyer. The lawyer got in lots of trouble. Definitely one of the most entertaining ethical board decisions of all time. One of my uncle's ex-wives actually hired a hitman to kill my uncle so she could collect his life insurance. The hitman was actually an undercover cop. She did 4 years for the crime. If this gets any response I'll tell a more in depth version of the story. Some crazy crap happened. In all honesty, I've never heard of a hitman, hired in the last 30 years, that wasn't an undercover cop, or an informant, or a con that turned the client in. Maybe I haven't looked hard enough, but you'd think that the legitimate hitman market would be hit pretty hard from the trend of police in their ranks. Not a divorce lawyer but my sister just went through a nasty divorce. It sounds like a movie you would see on Lifetime. They split up after 28 years of marriage because he fell in love with a lesbian stripper half his age. He emptied their savings and borrowed against their 401k so the lesbian could start her own lesbian bar which was bankrupt after 6 months. There are many more sordid details which I'll go into if anyone is interested. First of all, my now ex-brother-in-law is the least likely guy to do something like this. Imagine Mr. Cleaver, from Leave it to Beaver, cheating on Mrs. Cleaver. Totally unexpected. My sister found text messages on his phone. The lesbian in question already had two children. Yes, I know, not a very good lesbian, and was pregnant at the time she met my bro-in-law. The lesbian would show up at his work approximately once a week and get a check even though she was not employed there. He bought her a car and rented a house for her for a year, paid in advance. Even when all of this came out my sister wanted to reconcile. At the first counseling session he gets up after 15 minutes and says something like nope, not gonna happen and leaves. So her divorce lawyer requests financial documents from his business to decide alimony and child support. I forgot to mention they have four children together, the youngest of which is in college right now. Anyway, he didn't want to release any of the financial documents pertaining to this business so my sis says fine, I get the house and car and you get all the debt. He agreed to that which makes me want to know what he's trying to hide by not releasing the documents. Anyway the divorce was just finalized and my sister is devastated. This is the only man she's ever been with. They met in college and now 28 years later, nothing. The worst part is, if he asked her, I wouldn't be surprised if she took him back. I would lose all respect for her and do my best to talk her out of it. It was a real shock. 
I know the divorce is common but not in my family. Mom and dad were married 49 years before mom passed and none of my numerous siblings went through a divorce. Big scandal. More sordid details are required to accompany my morning coffee while I pretend to work. I'm late to the party, but here goes. There's this rich couple that are suing a company for something or other. A guy on the jury is hanging out with a friend one afternoon, and his buddy starts telling him about this cougar he's banging. Supposedly she is a giant, controlling B, but she spends a lot of her husband's money on him, so he puts up with it. Part way through the convo, he drops her first name, and the jury dude goes, wait, is her name friend replies, yeah, do you know her turns out it's the rich lady from the case he is on. The next day he had to recuse himself from the case, because he couldn't look at her the same way. The couple's lawyer demanded an explanation as to why he was dropping out in the middle of everything. So he had to tell the judge, the lawyer, the lady, and her husband. Ackwood. Anyways, that case was put on hold for a long time, because they had a divorce to get to. Oh and I've been a piece of crap lurker for like a year and a half. And this is my first post. So yay. My parents had an amicable divorce, agreed fully that joint custody was the best option for my brothers and I, and spent 18 years living near each other so my brothers and I would not have any issues traveling between. They treated each other with respect, and respected each other's rules. If I was grounded at mom's house, I was grounded at dad's house too. Her house, her rules, and you will respect them was dad's response one time when I was complaining about how unfair life was. They never spoke critically of the other, in our presence, never attempted to use or indoctrinate us against the other. They were flexible with custody times for vacations and whatnot, and even jointly cooperated on major life celebrations such as graduation parties and my brother's wedding. All of which, to say the least, is apparently absolutely crazy behavior for divorced people. Also, I probably don't appreciate my parents enough. My two favorites from working in a legal office. 1. Husband and wife get divorced. Wife went into the marriage with her own house and three cars, him with nothing. She mortgaged the house in her name, as the bank wouldn't give her anything if his name was on it too. To let husband start a trucking business, buys all his trucks for him and pays off the mortgage herself. He becomes successful. They divorce. She just wants enough money from him to square her mortgage. He can have the business and everything else. He sells everything to his friend for $10 next to nothing so that he's got nothing on his name and doesn't have to pay her squat. She's now going to lose the house. 2. Custody battle over two children. Father threatened the mother with a shotgun. Cut her phone lines. Got charged for assault on her. She flees town with the children. He demands she come back and she agrees to visitation so the kids can see their father. During one visitation he punches her brother in the face at the changeover point and tries to steal the children. Visitation stops and he chucks a fit that she's stealing his children and she's lying about being afraid of me. I did nothing the court psychologist signs off that he'd be an emotionally abusive sole parent. When the court says no to his demands that he get sole custody, he verbally abuses the judge, his lawyer his barrister, the psychologist, and the independent children's lawyer, in front of the entire courtroom. He narrowly avoids arrest, and the whole time this case is going he's always yelling and screaming in the office that the court system is biased and only women get custody. It's a mummy's court you're all sexist against men. ETC ETC. No, you're just a douche. 3. Man his wife and 3 kids, everything in his name. Finds a younger model, dumps her by text message, changes the locks, and goes into hiding. Wife has a chronic illness that means she can't work, and now she's stuck with three kids, and to rub it in he's changed all the bills and payments to her name mother's address and mailed her nearly $10,000 worth of accounts, and no one can find him. He sells everything to his friend for $10 so that he's got nothing on his name and doesn't have to pay her squat. I don't know what the law is like where you are from. But that really doesn't work anywhere that I know. Such a sale would be voidable on multiple grounds. Undervalued transaction and transaction to defeat creditors being the big ones. Let's see. 1. I've had a client come in to file divorce only to realize that the other party already obtained a divorce. He lied and never properly served her and she defaulted. Had to undo that one. 2. Put three fathers in jail for contempt. 
they had a sudden case of raids, recently acquired income deficiency syndrome, and refused to pay support to their dependent spouses and or minor children. 3. Had a guy completely sandpaper key the finish of a brand new Maserati that was given to the wife pursuant to settlement agreement because he hated his ex so much, also took off the tires. 4. Had a guy who funneled money over to his girlfriend, thinking he was slick hiding it from his wife, girlfriend broke up with him and kept it. 5. Have a guy who got a half million dollar settlement, and so he prepaid all of his expenses up front for several years so he wouldn't have to pay up. 6. Had a guy put all of his properties in the name of business partners so as to put it beyond the court's reach, and thus the wife's reach. Had another guy claim he was unemployed but moved his paychecks to a friend's bank account. 7. Had to get ex-party orders to inventory safes when I knew people had cash-based businesses, and injunctions to freeze bank accounts, so forth. Sometimes by the time we got it, it was too late and money was removed. 8. Absentee dads. Sorry to be gender specific, suddenly become fathers of the year, now he attends parent teacher conferences, now he goes to doctor's visits and soccer practices, never gave a dang before date of filing. 9. Men with midlife crises spending tons of cash on the girlfriend, vacations, jewelry etc, yet cries poverty when it comes to alimony in long term marriages where the wife was a stay at home for the past 35 years. 10. One guy faked a divorce decree from another country to avoid paying alimony. 11. Guy was adamant, to the point of tears that he never had sex with that woman. Took DNA test, was the father. 12. People wanting extra visitation just so they can get a reduction in child support. Then once the case is concluded, they leave the children with a nanny even though the other spouse is home and willing to care for the kids. 13. Had a guy stage a break in at my client's home. Stole her personal computer and other relics, then presents us with photo evidence he obtained from the computer about our client's infidelity. I have seen it all, really. Had a guy who funneled money over to his girlfriend, thinking he was slick hiding it from his wife. Girlfriend broke up with him and kept it. Loved that one. I'm not a lawyer but my parents divorced when I was 17 and it didn't finalize until I was 20. When I was a minor my mom was saying I was living in another country with her when it was clear through school records I was not out of the country. She made up stories that my dad abused me and didn't feed me when in 2 months of living with my dad I had a much better life than 16 horrible years with her after I turned a 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 Well yeah, once you're 18 it's adult napping. Everyone knows that. My ex-husband and I got divorced after 4 years. We had no kids, we were still dirt poor. So we went to a divorce center, paid a couple hundred bucks, and did it ourselves. We are still friendly 3 years later. People we know genuinely think our friendly divorce is one of the weirdest divorces they have ever seen. I know I'm late, but this story is too good. When I was young my parents had milk delivered to the house each week. It was a good deal, the milk was from a local coop, and the delivery routes were privately owned. The owner of our route was got divorced and told us the story of his mediation. She and her lawyer had calculated the value of his milk delivery business to be $2.50 million mind you. This was the mid 80s. She of course is seeking half that amount. His lawyer begins to balk that their estimate is unfair. It was probably legitimate when you calculated assets, inventory, balance, lack of debit, and revenue, and they would never agree to it, but he is cut short by his client. Our milkman then looks across the table and says something to the effect of I agree to your estimation. Go ahead and cut me a check. Everybody shows up at 6. You'll have to be there by 5 to have everything ready for them. He then tosses the work keys across the table as he sits back down. They eventually agreed upon a more reasonable number. Frick ya yeah, chicken milk. My favorite. I've worked on precisely two divorces. They were both awful. The first was just a terrible abusive situation. Sadly too common. And not a good source for stories. The second, though, was a mid 40s. Dink situation. Upper middle class engineers. Nobody was gonna go hungry at the end of it. Of course, we presumed it'd be a quick, painless negotiation. Nobody told us the husband was a raging alcoholic with no social skills. Nobody told us that the wife was very attached to the dog. 
we divided up the house, all possessions, the bank accounts, everything in under a week, except for possession of the dog. She was convinced he'd put the dog down. He kept saying it was man's best friend, not woman's. This case got slated for trial over who got the dog. I mean, that's downright extraordinary. That a divorce goes to trial at all is weird. That it goes to trial with no kids is weird. Uh, that it goes to trial where both people are financially stable and well off is, like, comet hitting you unlikely. That it goes to trial solely over the possession of a dog is, so far as I can tell from talking to other attorneys, unheard of. So, pre-trial conference, and the judge is ripshit that any of this is going on. He orders a final attempt at mediation, to begin after lunch. The husband sneaks away from his attorney to have a liquid lunch, and comes back absolutely trashed. Starts yelling about how he's going to go home and kill the dog to deny her it. Tries to jump over the table, assaults a bailiff, runs out through an in-session court, with the presiding judge on the bench. I never did find out how that one ended, as my internship ended before the case did, but I'll always remember it as the moment I decided that I didn't want to do family law. But fortunately for me, my current boss doesn't take those cases whatsoever. I had a batshit crazy client once involved in a dissolution of domestic partnership, not married, but had been together 20 years. She had an insane amount of stories about the opposing party, drug dealer, he had killed a man, and all sorts of other wild accusations. No idea what was reality versus what she made up. They had millions between them and were fighting over every last Native American artifact, household item, etc. At one point she offered me gold nuggets as a gift because she liked me so much, which I had to ethically refuse as a non daemonamis gift from a current client. I eventually got off the case when I changed jobs. I think it's currently under appeal now so I can't give any further detail, but there was some pretty crazy stuff involved in this case, including accusations that the opposing party was sleeping with his attorney, which shockingly had some basis in reality when investigated, but I got off the case right around then. When my parents got divorced my mom told my dad she only wanted me and not my brother and sister. Dad laughed and said she should try that in court and see how the judge takes her only wanting one child while abandoning the others. My dad got full custody. She also stole all of the money from their shared account and left us for like 2 years while my dad had to beg and borrow money to feed us and pay bills after she drained the account. She didn't even show up for the hearing and the judge even asked if my dad wanted child support, which he declined assuming collecting it from her would be more hassle than it was worth. My mom is a crappy human being. 16 years later and she hasn't changed a bit. I work with a woman who is a devout Christian. She met some guy from Nigeria online and fell in love. He was working as a Christian missionary in Singapore. She flew to Singapore. They got married and she helped him get US citizenship, etc. Eventually, she got pregnant and they had a daughter together. As soon as the girl was born. The father began getting her a passport and money together to take her to Africa so she could get circumcised. He eventually copped to marrying her solely to obtain US citizenship. She divorced him and was able to limit his supervised visitations to one hour per week due to his insistence on taking her to Africa to get the procedure done. He's still adamant to this day that his now 4 year old daughter should have her clitoris clipped. I worked in divorce law for a bit more than a year, and then got the frick out. Some highlights of what I've seen. Guy cheats on wife with wife's best friend. Wife steals 6 million dollars from his bank account and disappears. Guy gets multi million dollar inheritance. During divorce he spends it all on strippers. Literally the whole thing. Couple has over 5 million dollars in assets. Spend over 3 years getting divorced. Couple has liquidated retirement and sold their house. Still not divorced. Lawyers have millions of dollars. This is largely the reason I'm done with this crap. Ethically I can see why you are done but financially it was a terrible move based off bullet point 3. A couple of years ago my parents got a divorce. They're both very friendly people and they were always very cordial throughout the entire divorce process. In the end, the only thing they ever seriously argued over was who got to keep my pet rock from when I was in elementary school. They still argue over it to this day. That's really sweet actually. I'm not a lawyer, but I am in the process of getting a divorce. 
it's been quite messy, and that's without kids being involved. About 2 years ago my wife was cheating on me, did not know until she filed for divorce. She actually does not even know that I know still. Anyways, March of last year she filed for divorce. We had been separated since April of 2012 for work reasons. We talked every day, saw each other on Skype and even visited each other on vacations twice in a 10 month period for 17 days each time. Overseas contract work, nice pay, but time apart. The plan was to save up for 2 or 3 years and then buy another house and move into that. Anyways, after she filed I tried to kill myself a few times. Did not eat any food for over a month. I was so stressed that if I tried to eat I stupid eventually throw it up. I could not keep food down for more than an hour or two it seemed. Just water and the occasional binge drinking. We had all of our personal belongings in a storage unit. We were living in a 2400 square foot house. It was full. We also had a few bank accounts. Now, I won't give an exact number but we had 6 figures saved up. Low 6 figures, but 6. During the divorce process everything was fine aside from me wishing I was dead. I had devoted nearly 7 years to her for nothing. We were coming to an agreement on who got what from our storage unit, and how much money each of us would get from the bank accounts, plus the division of the vehicles. It was looking pretty fair. She was getting a lot more than I was because I just wanted it done so I was pretty much letting her pick out what she wanted. This was prior to court involvement. I had not even consulted an attorney myself even though she had one. Then just before we reached a deal in July of last year she went nuts. It was the 3rd of July while I was away at my family cabin. She drained all of the bank accounts. Every single penny was gone. She went to the storage unit and cleared all of the belongings out. Even my personal things like clothing, pictures, my important documents, medical records, everything I owned and had accumulated during my 28 years of life except for a bed, a desk and my computer with a few changes of clothes. She said I don't deserve anything since I want to be dead anyway and just took off. Had no idea it happened either until I got back from my cabin. It's still ongoing. We had court last month. It was hilarious. I hired a lawyer after she drained everything. She was breaking her own agreement. No assets were to be moved during divorce proceedings. My lawyer said he has never even heard of someone trying to disperse the amount of money she did, even with millionaire clients. I'm on the phone so I can't do too much for details but that's what I got for now. I'm not a divorce lawyer but my dad is a lawyer and he's divorced so wth. My dad was a real gem when he divorced my mom. He had my mom served while my sister was in the hospital with neuroblastoma. She had raditation and chemo and was in isolation because she had no immune system to speak of. The process server had to go to the children's hospital, go to the cancer ward, and break my sister's isolation seal to serve my mom the papers. The nurses had to escort him out. Also, it was Christmas Eve, and my mom's car was stolen that night after she had just moved out of his house and had it filled with all our stuff and Christmas presents. This one is so horrible I just don't believe it. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.